text. The webinar will begin shortly. Share questions and comments in the chat window. Questions will be reviewed during the Q&A period. Follow us on Twitter at NIA underscore SBIR. On LinkedIn, NIA Office of Small Business Research. Embedded links to closed captioning, tech support, feedback, and social media. Monique Larocque appears via webcam. Good afternoon and morning, depending where you are. The webinar will begin shortly. Before we do get started, we wanted to share a few housekeeping items to help make this a smooth process. Thank you for joining. We want to be sure that this is an interactive opportunity. So you'll see something a bit unusual uh, in terms of how you may have been participating in webinars in the past. We'll have a fun mock session, um, but we also want to get your questions and comments. So throughout the entire presentation, if you do have a comment, please feel free to chat us. If you have questions, please use the Q&A uh, feature that's on your panel. Usually it's either on the lower side or on the right. We do offer closed captioning, Zoom technical support. And if there's anything that you need from us, you can uh, chat out to the panelists. Your feedback is important, and so we want to let you know now that we are hoping that you'll stick around with us and fill out a feedback form. We will chat out this link so that you have it. And we want to make sure this is an ongoing conversation, so please feel free to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Title slide, NIA and STTR Virtual Workshop. Understanding the NIH peer review process. With that, I'd like to officially welcome you to the virtual workshop, Understanding the NIH Peer Review Process. Next slide. Hosts, NIH and sub-entities, nia.nih.gov slash SBIR. Our anchor host is the National Institute on Aging, but we are joined by several entities across NIH. I'd like to uh, acknowledge the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, the Center for Scientific Review, and our umbrella agency, the National Institute of Health. Next slide, please. Featured speakers, photos, and titles. We have several key featured speakers. Our keynote speaker will be Dr. Alan Rashan. We will also have Dr. Todd Heim from NIA, Stephanie Fertig from the HHS Small Business Program, and C at NIH, Lily Potia from NCATS, Dr. Zane Martin, Program Director from the National Institute on Aging, Derek Tabor, Dr. Derek Tabor is from the NIN National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. We're also pleased to welcome Dr. Kathleen Cooper from the Center for Scientific Review and Dr. Lyndon Joseph from the National Institute on Aging and the Division of Geriatrics and Clinical Gerontology. Next slide, please. Agenda, moderator Monique Larocque. We will do uh, welcome and introduction so that you have an understanding of our um, agenda here, but also our keynote speaker will be Dr. Alan Rashan. He will give you a review of the small business application and NIH process. This webinar was done in uh, response to feedback that we heard from many of um, you, and uh, we have done some market research on what our grantees want to hear. And this is a topic that we know has generated a lot of interest. So we hope that by the end of this session, you'll have a really good understanding of our review process. And then we'll undertake an actual mock peer review and have a moderated Q&A. Next slide, please. Review of Small Business Applications at the National Institutes of Health. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Alan Sean. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, if I am the uh, Scientific Review Officer. I have a couple of different SBIR study sections. I also am the coordinator for SBIR STTR review at CSR, so I'm um, kind of the, the point person for any of the the policy issues that CSR has to contribute and so on. So that's that's my background. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. Center for Scientific Review, Goal and Focus. All right. At the Center for Scientific Review, we have one overarching goal, and that's to make sure that every grant application that comes in receives a fair, independent, expert, timely review, and make sure that any 
inappropriate influences are kept away from that review so that NIH can fund the most promising research. Uh, we work closely with program, obviously, and provide feedback for the review to them so that they can decide what the funding is. Um, within our particular area, which is SBIR review, um, we like to start with a reviewer overview and tell them, look, what we're trying to find is what is proposed in the application. Will it have a profound and sustained influence on a research field or the marketplace that they're addressing? Uh, basically, it's, is it a great idea? Are these the right people to do it? Do they have a well thought out plan? And do they have the environment and the materials to take that plan to fruition? Next slide, please. Common impediments to getting your SBIR and STTR application started. Um, when you put your applications together, one of the things that we look at is up front is, are there issues that, that can cause problems? And there are several that can arise. Um, one, there are multiple registrations that you have to fill out in order to get your company into the system and able to submit. And if you miss any of those, you're going to hear about it from the system and they're going to kick you out. Um, we also need to find out or let you know that the submission is really several stages. Um, it comes into grants.gov, it goes to the division of receipt and referral, it comes to CSR for review, and it goes to program for decisions on funding and then so on. So it's, it's really multiple steps. And within each of those areas, there are multiple sub steps as well. And we'll go through at least in the review part, what it is that we do. Um, one of the big things that we advise people is do not submit your application at the last minute because invariably something is going to happen. Um, and when it does, you have a very short window to make sure that everything gets fixed, that everything's addressed, and that you've actually uploaded the document that you wanted to upload. Um, you would not believe the number of times we open up an application and we get people's resumes, we get notes to people, we get emails, we get all kinds of things that have no bearing at all on the application, but they get counted in the pages. Um, the other problem is that there is a very short window, as I said, and if you receive a warning from the system and try and fix it after the deadline, it's not going to work. So make sure that you have a clean submission prior to the deadline, and I'll tell you what the deadlines are in just a minute. Make sure that you're using the correct application forms. Right now we're on forms E, E or F. Um, anyway, make sure you've got the right applications. Um, NIH provides exhaustive documentation on how to submit an SBIR, STTR application. Please make sure that you check that and, and make sure that, that you're following those instructions. Um, do not overstuff, and by that we mean we have the requirement that you use an 11 point um, serif font, and we will frequently get applications in that are in 8 point, 9 point font. And basically what happens is that gives you an unfair advantage because you can stuff more information into those 6 or 12 page research plans than everyone else is doing, and so we try and have a level playing field. Everyone gets the same um, requirements, everyone gets the same review, and by overstuffing and, and thinking, putting things in places that they shouldn't be, that really is, is cheating. So um, one of the other pieces is that you really, if you're submitting a new application, it is a new dog. Um, it is coming in fresh, and therefore you should not be citing previous reviews, you shouldn't be talking about the previous scores, um, any types of outcomes or criticisms, and so on. So those are the, the top five or 10 problems that we see. Um, next slide, please. SBIR and STTR application review timeline. Due dates of September 5th, January 5th, and April 5th, along with review periods and SBIR links. Okay, the process is pretty standard and you can see it at the, the resources that are identified below. Um, we have three due dates. They will, applications will come in, after the due date, there's a two-day time period that you have to change it to check it and so on. Once that's done, it gets processed by grants.gov, sent over to the Division of Receipt and Referral. They take a, a, about a week or so, maybe two, to make sure that it, it's clean, that the application is compliant, and they will send it to the IRGs, and we'll get into all this. But here's the time frame that you can see. Um, 
So, you know, if you're, if you're planning, take these dates into account. Next slide, please. Appropriate SBIR and STTR study section. Um, CSR has about 40 different SBIR, STTR study sections. Now, they're not all running at the same time. Some of them come in and out, but we have about 6,500 applications that we review per year, and CSR does roughly 90 to 95 percent of all of the SBIR applications that come into NIH. We do the review. The, the institutes have some specialty study sections that some of them go to, but by and large, it comes to us. Now, you, there are tools within CSR that will help you figure out which study section might best fit your application, and that's the CSR assignment referral tool. Now, keep in mind that not necessarily will your view of what your application is match what the actual study section is doing. Um, DRR has done this for years. They have the latest descriptions of the study sections. They know what institutes will be funding um, particular science. And so they're the best group and will make the best assignment. Once an assignment is made, you can question it for a short period of time, but by and large, they're fairly spot on when they do this. Okay, um, next slide, please. How we prepare for your review. Okay, once DRR is finished with an application and is sent to the study section, the, the review group, the scientific review officer or SRO who is assigned to that study section will take the time to read every application. They want to make sure that it fits the focus of the study section. They want to make sure that if there are any problems, they're caught early. Um, some of these things we just flag, some of them are, are a cause for a major issue. We want to make sure that the scope and the focus of the project are appropriate for us, and we then look at what it is that the application is trying to do and identify the expertise we will need to evaluate it. Um, once we've done this and made sure that all of the applications are in the right place and they, they are appropriately set, um, we will send a notice to all of the applicants, letting them know that we have it and roughly when the review meeting will be and what to expect. Uh, after that, we start looking for people to fill the study section. And next slide. Recruiting reviewers. Okay. As you probably know, we have different types of panels at CSR. We have standing panels, which review R01 and R21 applications, and those have members that serve, are long serving and you know spend each review meeting with that group. SBIRs are run by SEPs, or special emphasis panels. And that means that every time we have a meeting, we have potentially a completely different roster. Uh, the rosters are put together based on the content of the applications as opposed to a general area of science. And so what we will do is start contacting people with the expertise that we need to review the proposals that we have in hand. So they may not be the same people from round to round. Um, just be aware of that. And in addition, when you go looking for reviewers, frequently they're gonna be busy. So there, we may have a reviewer that attends a given meeting at one point, but won't be there for the next one. So, you know, depending on what they've got going on in their lives. Next slide, please. Recruiting reviewers continued. When we look for people, what is it that we look for? Um, we need people who have a broad view of the area of science they're working on. We need to make sure that they have demonstrated scientific and technical expertise, either through publications or through positions within their company. Uh, we also want to make sure that they are not out screaming from soapboxes about particular aspects of science, that they're impartial. They should have a doctoral or terminal degree or the equivalent. Um, there are many cases where we have people that are not an MD, PhD, or um, even master's degree, but they have several years of significant experience carrying projects out to the marketplace. They should have a mature judgment, and as I said, they should have a really broad view of what the world is like. Uh, we are objective anytime we build a panel is we want people from academia so that we have access to the, the latest science. We also want people from small businesses and from the industry that actually will be using the tools that are being developed. 
So we will have people from pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies that are in the trenches doing things. We'll have people that are working in the small business to develop tools, technologies, and techniques. Um, at least one of, the thing, one of the things that we try and make sure is that we have at least 25% of the panel from business or other industry. Uh, this doesn't always happen and frequently we can run into problems, but that's our goal. We also want to make sure that we have representation from women and minority scientists. Um, we try and get as best as we can a geographic distribution so that we don't have everyone from California or Massachusetts being the reviewers. We also try to limit service on a, on a particular panel so that we avoid excessive service. Um, in general, that means we have people that will serve for about 12 review meetings over either a four year or six year period. Um, one of the things that I will encourage as the point person is that if you're interested in seeing what this is like, and if you'd like to try out working on some of these panels, please send me your CV. Let me know that you're interested. Um, we will put it into a centralized database that all of our SROs have access to, and it, they can search on expertise, they can search on your background and so on. So please feel free to contact me. Next slide, please. Making assignments. Okay, when we are working on making assignments, we have to figure out what it is that the particular application is doing and what expertise would be needed on that application. Now, SBIR, STTR applications, as you know, are pretty broad. So they will have a variety of different things and we try to make sure that we have the science that's needed, the commercial that's, um, expertise or viewpoint that's needed as well as a user. And we will do that when we're putting the, the assignments together. We generally have somewhere between five to six weeks after we have processed the applications and before the meeting that we will distribute applications to reviewers. Each application gets three reviewers. So there's a primary, secondary, and tertiary reviewer. We ask them that they prepare full critiques, and we'll get into what that is in just a minute, um, all three full critiques, but bear in mind that the requirement for the third reviewer is that they give us an overall impact and scores only. Um, that's, that's their minimum level of, of input. Reviewers, before they even see your application, are going to be trained by the SRO on what the SBIR, STTR program is, what the review criteria are, and what they can and cannot say about things. Um, and then we follow up with them as they're reviewing and as they submit their critiques to make sure that they follow those instructions. Next slide. Managing conflicts of interest, COI, personal, professional, financial, etc. I saw one of the questions come through about conflicts of interest. This is probably the major job that an SRO has when they're putting together the panel. Uh, in addition to finding the right people, they've got to make sure that there are no conflicts. And there are a variety of ways we look at it. I mean, from, a, from the standpoint of identifying them quickly, we'll know if an institution is part of an application or if an institution is a competing um, area. You also have the ability to ask CSR to exclude certain people from review because you either have had problems with them in the past, there are ongoing legal actions, they're a direct competitor, and so on. We will try and honor those in every case. Um, one of the problems that I frequently see, and I'm sure other SROs do too, is the blanket uh, request for uh, excluding reviewers. And so by the time you say, for example, I have a zebrafish application and I want no one in the area of zebrafish research looking at it because they'll steal my ideas, well, then we have a problem because now how do we get someone that has a knowledge of the area to review the application? So when you request an exclusion, you should really tailor it to the two specific people. Okay, so personal, um, you know, you can read this fairly easily. Basically, it's if they are going to gain financially, if they're going to gain a position of power, or if they're going to gain some kind of respect within the community by either being a reviewer or being, being associated with the application, then that's a conflict. Um, and that extends to not only the reviewer, but members of the family. In addition, um, we try to make sure that we don't have 
the anyone that has a direct competition com competition with the applicant's company. And when you submit an application 30 days before the review, you will see the roster. And if you see someone that is a problem in terms of your viewpoint, you notify the SRO and we'll take that into account. Um, the other piece that we do is of course, um, longstanding scientific disagreement. And that is generally brought forth by either the applicant or by the reviewer. And then there's the issue of personal bias. Um, all of this not only is actual, but also appearance. Um, if we have people that are on the panel that would have the appearance of a conflict, we're pretty conservative. We'll generally exclude them from reviewing that application. Um, next slide, please. Managing COI continued examples. Okay, a couple of examples, financial interest, of course, or receiving $10,000 or more from an applicant who has got an application in, uh, future intellectual property conflicts. And in this case, it's, we see this frequently with the smaller companies that are working in a specific area. And then if, if an application comes in, let's say, for example, they're working on cardiovascular um, hematology or something like that, and the application works in an area that they're working in, the reviewer can say, I don't want to see this application because there's a potential for intellectual property conflict down the road. And so we will we'll make sure that they don't have access to that. If we have an applicant um, that is on the panel, that person is out of the study section. So if you have an application coming in, you can't be a reviewer in the same area that, that will be reviewing your application. And then we have the issue of if, if a reviewer has served uh, four times on the panel within the last six rounds, that's kind of excessive service and, and we will try and keep that at a minimum. Um, next slide, please. SBIR review criteria, how your application will be judged, overall impact and core review criteria. Okay, so we've got the panel and you're probably wondering what is the what is the group going to do? How are they going to look at it? And it was like I said, we want to see that the reviewers will want to see an application that has a great idea that is going to make a sustained impact on the market, the research field, the people involved working in the field, something. And it's, we have five core criteria that we use to evaluate that in addition to the overall impact. And that is, what is the significance of the project going to be to the marketplace or to the science that's involved? And do you establish that need with rigor of prior research? So that can be citing the literature and citing the, the problems that are brought up in that literature. It can be preliminary data that shows how it is that you're tackling this project and so on. Then there is the investigative team or investigator. Do they have the skills necessary to tackle the project that they've laid out for us? Um, the question of innovation is basically, is this a 13th item that's been submitted or is it something new? Is it some different way of doing things? And one of the things that we stress to SBIR panels is that this does not necessarily have to be brand new science. In many cases, when you're trying to bring things to market, what you're doing is taking known pieces and combining them in a unique way. So if you address a unique problem, then it's, it's generally going to be considered innovative. Approach, that's your six page research plan or 12 page research plan if it's if the phase two fast track so on. And that you are gonna lay out what you're planning to do, perils and pitfalls, how you're gonna analyze things, what are your go, no go decisions? Um, do you consider the various issues such as biological variables? Do you take into account all of the problems that potentially run into missing data, corrupt data, how do you integrate things? How do you approach things? And then finally, do you have the ability to bring resources to bear? So your environment, do you have the equipment? Do you have the facilities? Can you get the chemicals? Can you get the cells and et cetera? Um, next page. Additional SBIR review criteria. Okay. Um, so we have the core criteria, then there are the additional review criteria that can impact either significance, imp overall impact, or approach. And those are in a phase one, 
is this really something that is going to go on and become a product? Can you see the gleam in, in the application's eye, if you will, that there is a commercial potential here? Now, this does not ask for a commercialization plan, which is in phase two, direct phase two, and fast track applications. It is merely a statement of here's how what we're doing fits into a particular niche area or a particular area. This is what we're trying to accomplish. So a couple of sentences, a paragraph at most in a phase one application. Um, then there are milestones that are put in place and they have to be measurable, meaningful, quantifiable. And that's true for all applications. In other words, tell us how you're going to judge that you've made it to where you said you wanted to go. And if our panel looks at it and says, yes, good, good milestones, definite decision points, then that's, that's evaluated very positively. And then there are issues of human subjects, if you have them, vertebrate animals and biohazards and how you handle those. Um, there are tons of literature points and, and documentation available that will explain well, what those are and what need to be considered. Um, we can go into that at some other time. Next slide, please. Review instructions, phase one applications, R41 and R43. Okay, types of applications. When we have phase one applications, all right, First, let me back up a little bit. When we set up the meeting, we divide the applications into phase one, so that's one cluster, and phase two, fast track, and direct phase two. That's a second cluster, because the review criteria for those two clusters are totally different, and we want to keep eggs in the correct baskets. So with a phase one application, which are the 41, R41s and R43s, R41s are STTRs, R43s are SBIRs. Um, what we're looking at is the fact that you're not required to submit preliminary data. The purpose of the project is to establish feasibility and we need a rigorous experimental plan. Now, if you provide preliminary data, that's open to a discussion, interpretation, and evaluation. Uh, commercialization, commercial potential, as I've said, is part of the significance, milestones, and so on. Um, R41s, STTRs, there's a requirement that you have a nonprofit research institution, and there's the, the pieces. R43, you can use up to 30% of the, your budget for uh, consultants and, and contractors. Next slide, please. Review instructions. Phase two applications, 2R42 and 2R44. Okay, for phase twos, and those are the 2R42s and 2R44s, they are built on top of a successful phase one. So you've already done the phase one research, you've reached your milestones, you're going to explain very briefly in the phase two how you did that and, and the quality. You need the data from that phase one work to apply for a phase two. And here we're now talking about commercial potential. You have to have a commercialization plan. And that's a 12 page document that explains a whole bunch of things that we'll go into in just a minute. Um, once again, percentages, you can see them here. I don't need to read them. Next slide, please. Review instructions, fast track applications, 1R42 and 1R44. Okay, for fast tracks, that is a mechanism that it was put in place to help companies avoid the gap between the phase one submission review and a phase two submission and evaluation. So the idea is that you can put them both together. They have to be distinct, separate projects with distinct, separate budgets. The phase one portion is a standalone project. It's got clear milestones for success that have to be achieved before instituting, instituting phase two. While preliminary data is not expected or not required, it is expected and you do have to have a commercialization plan. Um, what happens is that the panel will review the entire application, will send it to program, program then looks at it and says, okay, here's the phase one if it's awarded. At the end of phase one, you tell program, how you accomplished your goals, and they will make the decision of whether to go ahead and fund the phase two or not. There's no additional review. So that, that's how it avoids the, the gap. Next slide, please. Review instructions, direct to phase two applications, 1R44. Okay, direct phase two is your chance that you've done a little work on your own. You think you've got a fairly good idea. You have preliminary data or interest. 
you can skip the phase one and go direct to a phase two application. So you've already done the research. You tell us what the milestones are. The panel evaluates those. Preliminary data is required because you uh, have done that work. Also, the commercialization plan is required. This application is reviewed just like a phase two. So they will look at the 12 page research plan, look at the 12 page commercialization plan, the bio sketches and so on and, and decide based on that. Next slide, please. Review instructions, commercialization plan. For commercialization, we've been talking about this. Um, basically, there are the seven points you see here. What's the value of the product? Um, how is it going to benefit the community around? What is the company? What's your history? Do you have the right people in it? Have you identified who your marketplace is, who your customer is? Can you tell us about competitors? What is it that you offer that they don't have? Tell us how you're protecting your invention. Um, what is it that, that you have to take care of your intellectual property? And then if you have any kinds of commitments for funding or follow on funding, if you have commitments from people to purchase your product, um, how, does those, how do those factor into a finance plan? And then you're of course gonna go into how you're gonna produce the widgets you're producing and then what you expect in terms of revenue stream distributors, how you're gonna run your business. So those are all the things that, that reviewers look for when they evaluate commercialization. Next slide, please. What reviewers look for in SBIR and STTR applications? The reviewers, like I said, have been trained. Um, they need to know what is it that you're doing? Where is the need? Why is there a need for the product that you're describing? How significant is this going to be to the marketplace that you're going after? Is it the first? Is it the second? Is it the third? But it really has an improvement over everything else that's there. Um, if you have worked in the field for a while, um, how successful have you been in introducing things that change concepts and so on? Uh, does the product have the, the potential to become a marketable product? And one of the things that we instruct here is that all of these projects are generally long time frame. So when you're evaluating the application, the commercial potential that you're looking at is at the moment with a vision for what's down the road because there is no way in 12 pages that you can put every possibility um, but you need to to present in the framework or the, the panel will look for have you presented within the framework of where you are now what it is you need to take the next step forward next slide please common problems in sbir and sttr applications um frequently a reviewer first reviewers by and large are very reticent to make really harsh comments. So if they see that there is no significance in the project, that it's describing something, some minor interest, or really the application hasn't made a convincing case, you'll see a comments within either significance, within approach, within innovation, within the overall impact that says, I don't see what you're doing here. And so you know, that's, that's what the, the issue is. Um, have you done an adequate job of looking at the scientific literature? One of the things that we frequently hear from reviewers is, well, there is a whole body of literature that addresses a lot of what these people are doing, so I'm not sure what it is they bring to the table. Um, you should bring that out when you put your submission in, before you, know, before you send it in. Establish a firm floor for what you're up to. Um, which also goes to a lack of knowledge of relevant work. Um, experimental approach, do you have scientific rationale put together? Do you have rigor of research? Do you have well-reasoned argument for why you're doing what you're doing? Have you looked at the possibility of other outcomes and how do you deal with them? Do you have expertise in all of the methodology or does someone on your panel have expertise? Um, one of the things that, that will hit frequently is the lack of rigor, especially statistical rigor in analyzing data. Finally, the other piece that, that we will hear frequently is, well, you know, they've got a really good idea here and so on, but this is a six month project and it's really overly ambitious given they've got 32 aims. So make sure that the amount of work that you're putting together matches the people that you have and the time frame that you're working in. Um, next slide, please. Organizing study sections, managing the review meeting. Okay, at the meeting, and you're gonna see what happens. We will send the 
critiques out, the assignments out, we get the critiques and overall impact scores uploaded. We check for missing information, for errors, for mismatched comments, um, for violations of all kinds of things. And then within the clusters that I talked about originally, phase one and phase two, we will rank order the average of the three overall impact scores and select the top 50% within each of those two clusters to be discussed at a meeting. So when you see um, some of you have seen, I'm sure your summary statements come back and you, you see the score of ND, which means not discussed. That means that it fell below the 50 the initial 50% of the um, scoring within that group of applications. Once we have those 50%, we randomize for the discussion. So we don't start with the best scoring application and work to the worst. Um, we start randomly. And so that's, that's how we will approach it within the, the study section meeting. Next slide, please. Nuts and bolts of SBIR and STTR peer review. Infographic poster from public.csr.nih.gov slash news and policy slash outreach resources. I need to pick this up. Um, we have available on our resources section a uh, poster of what peer review does. So this is really a, an overview of how the process works. Um, you can go ahead and download it from the URL that's sitting there. Next slide, please. SBIR and STTR website, sbir.nih.gov slash review. Um, we also have lots of information on review policy, on review resources, on how things are done, um, including um, some of the um, example applications and example critiques that are available and you can download those as well. Um, head to the sbir.gov website. And I think that's it, yes. Mock peer review session. Disclaimer, applications that the panelists will evaluate are not real. Panelists are actors and science is made up. Okay, so this is what we've, we're talking about. Um, that's, that's the framework. And now we are going to have a bunch of the folks from NIH offer to show you what a study section would look like. Now this is a mock section. So the applications are smashed together from a variety of them. We will have the people um, representing the SRO, the chair, the reviewers. These are folks that work at NIH. They have sat through multiple review sessions. So we're, we're pulling bits and pieces over what's going on. So uh, we have a question on, pen, on uh, timing. Okay, usually, I'll answer that one really quickly. When we get the, the applications in, like I said, we have four to six weeks to provide those to the reviewers and for them to give us um, information back. Once the, the study section is held, CSR is required to have the uh, critiques released to program and to the applicants 30 days after the meeting. So that's, that's the deadline at the end. Uh, frequently, we get them out sooner, but we have 30 days. For scores, we try and get those out two to three days after the review meeting. So that's, that's working days as well. Um, so you should know two to three days after the meeting what your score is. And then within 30 days, you should get a, a um, notification from Commons that your summary statement is ready for viewing. Okay, shall we bring everyone back? Yes, please. Thank you. And I just wanted to, while we get ready to transition into the mock peer review, um, we see a nice steady flow of questions. Feel free to please send your questions in. We are tracking all of them and will respond to them during the Q&A. Please also uh, fill out that feedback form as well as uh, connect with us on LinkedIn. Take care and I hope you enjoy the show. Roles, photos and character names. Reviewers, Kurt Alec, H. Equity, Tanya Stark, Carmen San Diego, Julia Ogden, SRO Peter Marshall, Chair Dana Scully, Program Officer Grant Love. So each reviewer is going to introduce themselves and their roles. So Kurt Alec, can we start with you? While Kurt works on his uh, audio, Tanya, do you want to begin? 
Stephanie Fertig. Thanks. So I think um, how we're going to do this is, um, and this is similar to something we've done previously. So how are we going to do this? I'm going to turn this over to our, um, our SRO and our chair for this uh, study section. And as noted in the disclaimer, while we do like to have fun with this, the hope is that this is a great learning exercise on, on how a review is structured and, and how things um, operate. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the chair and the SRO, and you guys can get us started and kick kick us off. Alan Rashan. Okay, um, let's start. Generally, what will happen is that we'll all get together with our coffee in the seminar room. Uh, we've been doing it by Zoom for the last several months, so it's it's still the same type of organization. And what will happen is that the SRO will start the meeting, and we will do it as follows. Um, this meeting is closed to the general public in accordance with provisions of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA. Only those reviewers and NIH staff having relevant official business will be present. Now, we each have a role to play in the review of these applications. I'm the designated federal official for this meeting and will monitor the process to make sure that each application receives an objective and fair initial peer review and that all of our applicable laws, rules, regulations, and policies are followed. And in order to, for me to fulfill this role, all of the business for this meeting must be conducted in my presence. So when we have uh, hotel meetings, that means you don't get to talk about the applications you just reviewed outside the room. Any comments have to be done in my presence. Now the chair is going to guide the scientific discussion for this review and they will let you know what they expect. You as reviewers are serving as ad hoc advisors to the federal government and we really appreciate your service. Now please be aware that you have agreed to serve under the rules and regulations set forth in FACA. So one of the cornerstones of our review process is confidentiality. Everything that we discuss, all of the paperwork, all the materials, all the conversations, all the deliberations and assignments related to this meeting are confidential. They must be kept confidential and therefore if anyone asks you about this meeting, and that's applicants, that's your colleagues, that's other individuals, any questions, please tell them that you're not at liberty to discuss it and then refer it to me and refer them to me. Um, we will handle any questions and comments. Um, we take this very seriously. Consequences for breaches in confidentiality and review integrity may include removing reviewers from study sections, barring reviewers from receiving federal funding, and in some cases referring the, the case to investigation and possible legal prosecution. So this is serious, please take it so. Uh, conflict of interest, we have sent several emails to you defining what a conflict of interest is. You've signed off on several forms stating that at that stage of the review, you have seen no conflicts. Um, we will take care of anything that pop up during the meeting with the post meeting review conflict form. So if during the discussion you hear something and you go, oh, I know him and oh, I think I shouldn't be here. Let me know, let the ESA that's working in the meeting know and we'll put you in conflict and remove you from the discussion. And finally, scientific misconduct. If during the discussion you feel that there has been a fabrication, falsification or plagiarism in the work that's being proposed, please let me know, do not talk about it to the panel because after all uh, an accusation is not a proven thing until it's gone through the entire process. We will go ahead and review the application. We will refer the issue to the Office of Research Integrity and they will investigate it. So it will be out of our hands. So, and with that, I will turn it over to our chair and take on my SRO role. Kathy Cooper. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. So what we do at this point in time, hopefully I have started my video, is um, I, as the chair, will lead a uh, introduction that goes around the table. Since we don't have a table, um, I'll introduce myself and then I will call on the other reviewers to introduce themselves and basically they'll just say a little bit about what their background is and why they're there. 
Um, after we do that and introduce any observers in the room, then we will start discussion of the applications. So first, I am the chairperson. I am Dr. Dana Scully. I am the chief scientific officer of Micro Implants LLC. We design and manufacture custom micro implants for domestic customers, international customers, and beyond. Okay, so our next person is Dr. Kurt Alec. Would you introduce yourself? Todd Hyam. Hello, this is Dr. Kurt Alec. I am a double endowed professor at three esteemed research institutions, and thus I have a lot of expertise to impart on everything relating to this review panel. So any questions you have, I will be able to answer them and can tell you which applications are good. Thank you, Dr. Alec. Um, our next reviewer is Mr. H. Equity. Derek Tubor. Mr. Equity, would you like to good, introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is H. Equity, and I am the owner uh, of a small um, company called ETEC Interplanetary, Interplanetary Health. It's my pleasure to be here. I have several grants from uh, NIMHD as well as other institutes. Um, dealing with SBIR and STTR. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Equity. Um, the next reviewer would be Dr. Julia Ogden. Zane Martin. Hello, my name is Dr. Julia Ogden. I'm a, an accomplished pathologist at the Toronto Mercy Hospital. I also do some collaborative work with my husband, the famous Detective Murdoch, on some inventions. Uh, that are very mysterious and for proprietary reasons I will not discuss. Well, thank you, Dr. Ogden. Um, our next reviewer is uh, Dr. Carmen San Diego. Lily Portia. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Carmen San Diego. I am professor at Acme University of the Sciences. Okay. And uh, last but not least is Dr. Tanya Stark. Stephanie Fertig. Hi, my name is Dr. Tanya Stark. I'm the CEO and president of Stark Industries, LLC. We had, um, uh, the company used to work predominantly in the defense um, industry, but has now moved more towards healthcare and healthcare robotics. Um, and so I'll be able to talk a lot about the robotics and, and different new technologies and innovative technologies in the healthcare system. I have to ask uh, Carmen San Diego, where are you? I am in Croatia today. I'm in Dubrovnik. Very nice. Mm. All right. Um, then once we've introduce the reviewers. Um, we also tend, we also go around the room and introduce any observers who are present at the meeting. It's very common for our observers to be program officers who have an interest in applications that are going to be reviewed at that meeting and they are strictly observers. They listen and they learn. Um, I believe we have one program officer today, Dr. Love. Lyndon Joseph. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Dr. Grant Love, and I'm a program officer at the Technology Institute at the National Institute of Health. And my portfolio includes um, small business grants, um, either through a small business or through university that's the technology grants. Thank you. Fantastic. All right. Well, we're ready to get started with our discussions. Um, our first application is going to be a new <clears throat> phase one. SBIR application, also as a clinical trial. Um, before we start, we're going to collect some preliminary scores from the three assigned reviewers. So our three assigned reviewers are Mr. Equity, Mr. Alec, and I mean, Dr. Alec, excuse me, and Dr. Ogden. So uh, Mr. Equity, can you give me your preliminary score, please? A four. A four, okay. Dr. Alec, what is your preliminary score? Seven. Ooh, okay, seven. And Dr. Ogden, what is your preliminary score? A four. A four, okay, fine. All right, so to get started, um, Dr. Equity, you I mean, pardon me, Mr. Equity, you can go first. Um, what we'd like you to do is just very briefly um, describe the application, what's it about, and then please let us know what are the score driving 
points that led to your score, including things like scientific rigor, the milestones, and the commercialization potential, since this is a phase one. Please go ahead, Dr. Uh, Mr. Equity. Thank you. People get me mixed up all the time with those doctors, and especially those that have double endowed professorships. Uh, but I have not, I don't have one of those degrees. Um, I'm just a, a businessman, and I like to start companies and make them successful. So, Mr. is my preferred title. Thank you. This first time submission, which I like very much, uh, is from a small company in South Carolina, and it proposes a novel telehealth computer tablet assisted intervention called Partners at Meals. If successful, this ambitious cluster randomized trial intervention will result in the following. The primary outcome is a demonstrated improvement in nutritional status and dysfunctional behaviors and quality of life and quality of life for participants with dementia. The secondary outcomes, uh, but they're really too many to mention, um, are, uh, well, let me just go to the score drivers for this. My score drivers, great team of interventionists and researchers with experience in the care of individuals with dementia and in designing effective interventions. Conceptually, I love the multi-level perspective. They make a strong case for the need for this product, supported by a strong literature review and logical and scientifically compelling narratives. One important aspect of this intervention is that the meals will be consumed at either enhanced usual care sites or the participant's home. This is a novel aspect feeding individuals at their home, especially for individuals with dementia, will minimize their upsetness in terms of traveling to a new place. Let me now share my concerns that drove my score towards not so good, um, the higher levels. This team has little experience in developing marketable technologies. They have great ambition. In fact, it is too much as reflected in the long list of secondary outcomes. Consequently, some of the components are underdeveloped and include a lack of details regarding the trial design, participant dyads and population attributes, site selection, including inclusion and exclusion criteria, racial and ethnic and SES population attributes, and the use of the computer of the computer tablets and details around the train the trainer components. I'll stop here now to give my esteemed colleagues a chance to respond. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Equity. Um, our second reviewer had slightly different opinion and that would be uh, Dr. Alec. Why don't you tell us what you think about this application, focusing more on a brief concurrence with the primary reviewer, but also letting us know additional points or points where you have a difference of opinion. Sure, so Mr. Equity did a great job of talking about the strengths of the application, or at least Thank you. Know them as strengths, uh, you know, in terms of a strong team um, and great goals. I think where I differed on this application is how likely and, you know, how much do we believe that they're actually gonna be able to achieve such goals. So, you know, getting a little bit more specific there, the first thing I noticed is, you know, they say that they're going to demonstrate all these improvements. Um, I did not see any preliminary data that suggests uh, that they, they will. Pardon me, Dr. Alec, they, it's a phase one. They don't require preliminary data. They can make their case in another way. Well, I just, I didn't see enough of a likelihood of, and many of these other applications have preliminary data that tells me it's likely to succeed. No, no, really, they can make their case based on a thorough literature review or other factors. It does not have to be preliminary data. Okay. And let That'll... me jump Let me jump in here too yes, also. Try not to compare applications. We want to look at each application as a standalone entity. Thank okay. you. Point, Dr. Oh, okay, well, that'll be said. Let's, let's jump to the next issue here. So they talk about um, 
how they're going to have these two trials with 60 patients each. It's unclear if that's enough for statistical power and is this a really powered study and it's all gonna be in one state and how much can you extrapolate that? Because I mean, I assume they're gonna develop this for more than one state. Um, so that was a concern. And then um, they also uh, talk about, as Mr. Equity said, that they are going to demonstrate improvement in nutritional status and dysfunctional behaviors. But how are they assaying that? What experiments are they actually doing to demonstrate such improvement? I did not see that in the application and that is critical. I'll stop there and I can bring up more okay. weaknesses if the other reviewers would like. Well, why don't we let our third reviewer, Dr. Julia Ogden weigh in again, just, you know, talking briefly about how you agree, but also bringing out any points where you disagree. Okay, um, sure. So uh, overall, I pretty much agree with my esteemed colleagues on both the negative and the positive uh, critiques. I would like to add though, the, the biggest critique that hasn't been mentioned yet is uh, the difficulty I had, at least, uh, in reading the application. The, the, it, there was poor grantsmanship uh, because of this difficulty to read. The figures uh, were very small font. The labels um, were difficult to read, and it looked like even they were mislabeled in some of the figures. Um, so that was why my score was a four, but I could even go even worse because of this poor grantsmanship. Okay, all right. Um, so we have some additional things to talk about since this is a clinical trial. Um, what about their study timelines? Any of our assigned reviewers want to weigh in on that? I didn't have any problems with their study timelines. I thought they were reasonable. I think they may have some challenges facing them in terms of, of actually being able to get into people's houses. You know, unfortunately, we're in the midst of COVID-19, and so getting into people's houses isn't so easy. And it also comes with its own threat to the health of the people that will be actually going in to provide the respite care. Of course, so Dr. Equity, there, Courtney, that's my yes, only okay, concern. Yes, okay, I think our, our chair is going to address this point. Mr. Dr. Equity, Marshall? Yeah. Um, one of the things that we recently re released guidance on was the impact of COVID on research. And it was stated that when reviewing applications or when submitting, assume that the impact of COVID will be taken care of before the application is actually executed. So if that has affected your score, um, you need to rethink it. At least rethink Thank that you. part of I it. Just, I, I just love NIH for being concerned about that. And it's not gonna be a problem. I'll easily revise my score to take that consideration out. Thank you. Okay, great. I have one more question before we open the discussion. Um, obviously, this is a clinical trial. What, what about human subjects protection? and inclusion of women, minorities, and individuals across the lifespan. How is that addressed in this application? Any assignment? I can reviewer? speak to that as well. Okay, surely. One, uh, one of the issues that uh, I did note in terms of my score driver, poor score driving points, was that they did not pay much attention to addressing and providing details around the populations that will be in Included. Okay. This includes not only race, ethnicity, but also SES. They'll be working both in rural populations as well as in, in rural areas, as well as in urban areas. And I thought more attention to detail in terms of the differences they might expect and how it might influence their protocols was warranted. Okay. Okay. Understood. Um, I can, I can add in that, you know, I thought the, uh, the populations, I mean, as Mr. Equity said, there may be some things missing there, but if you then just look at the overall population, it, it wasn't clear to me that we're actually going to know that this definitely works and this is an SBIR. Should we not know that at the end of the study? 
So you're saying that the, the number of, of, of participants is too low? Well, I, I mean, what, what are we supposed to know at the end of an SBIR? Are we supposed to know for sure that it works? Or is it just supposed to be, you know, proof of concept? Huh? Well, this is a phase one. It is a phase one. They don't have to take it to the market at the end of the phase one. It can be proof of content, a concept. Okay, so even if they don't have statistical power and it's just mm -hmm. you know showing that there's a trend and that this could lay the stage for future studies, that, that is the expectation for phase one? Mm -hmm. It could be. Okay, that helps. Okay, fantastic. Great. That's the expectation oh. I had out of this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good to know, Mr. Equity. Thank you. Um, okay, we can open the discussion to the unassigned uh, panelists. Would anyone like to contribute some thoughts or ask some questions? Question. Um, is, is now when we talk about the budget, I had some budgetary no, concerns. Not yet. We, we talk about the science first, then score, and then we talk about non-scored issues like the budget. We'll get to that in a minute. Well, what about, um, I did have some questions around the um, the time that the, the PI is going to be spending on this project. I, I noticed they just don't have a lot of, you know, their level of we effort can, here is very low. Is, is that something about, we can talk about now? No, let's, let's talk about that when we get to the budget. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, any other scientific parts of the discussion? Okay. Well, then let me try to uh, briefly summarize where I think we are before we offer some suggested final scores. Um, there were some definite strengths to this project. It was a great team. They have experience. Um, they have a novel idea of how to deliver um, these meals at home. Um, these were balanced to some extent by some concerns about the fact that the plan was a little bit sketchy in terms of its detail perhaps even overly ambitious. Um, and uh, there was some concerns initially about statistical power, but at the end, I believe you agreed that they had enough participants in the study to make a, a phase one equivalent um, initial proof of concept. Does that, um, does that capture the science? Great, all righty. So then why don't we revisit the scores. What score would you suggest as a final overall preliminary, uh, pardon me, overall score, Dr. Pardon me, Mr. Equity? Based on some of the comments my colleagues made, I'm going to move from four to five. Okay, a score of five. Uh, then we have um, Dr. Alec. Where are you? Yeah, so, you know, in deference to some of my colleagues, you know, even though yes, one of them does not have a advanced degree, um, like which I, is know, not necessary. But, okay, well, we anyway, I will, thank you, thank um, you very much. Anyway, I, I will come to a six for my seven. You're a six. Okay, and then finally, Dr. Ogden, where what score do you recommend? Well, after this uh, very fruitful discussion, um, I think I will also change my score for, to a six. To a six. All right, so we have a preliminary score, uh, pardon me, a yes. final score suggested range from five to six. Does anyone plan to vote outside that range? Okay, great. Then um, mark your score sheets electronically, and then we'll go on to the next part of the discussion. So at this point in time, we can talk about the budget. Would somebody Please. like to tell me what you think of the budget? Yeah, I mean, I, I had a concern about the budget um, mm -hmm. that I had mentioned earlier. I you know I have a, uh, some concerns that really that that about the amount of time that the PI, you know, and the percentage and level of effort the PI is going to be spending on the grant. I thought it was very low. And I also noticed that the, the overall budget is over the, the small business, the, the budgetary, you know, caps that are for SBRs and STTRs. I mean, it, it just seemed like it was over what you're allowed to ask for. Well, that would be a programmatic issue after the review is done. So um, I okay. report the answer. Well, mm -hmm. actually, could I ask a question about that? Okay. Aren't they allowed to exceed the statutory caps if they uh, are, are addressing a waiver or one of the waiver topics? 
Right, there so are, because, it is entirely up to program whether they can exceed the cap, which is why we don't make this a review issue. It's is that the, making their decision. Well, is that well, the guy they, that's seeing all the faces? Can he, can he tell us, you know, what he thinks that he's the program, but, right? Well, but wait, 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 know, wait just a minute. Wait, wait just a minute, please. Um, they included in their apps application a mm -hmm. justification for meeting the budget cap and then mm -hmm. for exceeding it based mm -hmm. on the fact that there was a waiver. It, falled un it mm -hmm. fell under one of the waiver topics. And they really laid this out very clearly. So and that will be very helpful to program staff when they're thank looking you. at the summary statement and making decisions about funding. Okay, fantastic. Um, I think we are done. Dr. Marshall, did I leave anything out? No, you covered it. Perfect. Then we're ready to move on to the next application. So this application is a phase two and a resubmission. Um, it is a uh, application. Uh, we have three assigned reviewers. The primary reviewer is Tanya Stark. The secondary is Carmen San Diego, and the third reviewer is Julia Ogden. So, starting with Dr. Stark, can you give me your preliminary score? Two. All right. And Dr. San Diego? A six. A six. Okay. And then finally, Dr. Ogden, what is your preliminary enthusiasm? A one. A one. Oh, we've got some interesting spread here. Well then, um, Dr. Stark, why don't you tell me what's so great about this application? Great. So this is a phase two resubmission from um, Art Deck to continue development of their new pill stream system. So as you all know, medical errors can cause significant harm to residents of long-term care facilities and a use of unit dose medications takes staff time and have high error rates. Um, in addition, there are costs associated with waste when prescriptions change or patients um, leave the facilities. So while Medicare and Medicaid are requiring shorter cycles to reduce waste, um, this also has the unfortunate consequence of potentially increasing staff time and potential errors. So uh, the PillStream system will incorporate the TileJet robot to uh, provide high accuracy, high throughput production of custom multi-medication packages. And the hope is that this will allow central fill pharmacies to provide long-term care facilities with short cycle dispensing at reduced cost and allow um, them to return the unused medications because they have a closed use, closed loop capability. So this um, is a resubmission um, they in the phase one of a phase two. So in the phase one, they created this prototype. It exceeded their uh, primary uh, success criterion um, with regards to accuracy, as well as exceeding the target fill rate by 50%. And in this phase two, they're proposing to build and test a larger, fully functional pill stream prototype that is able to dispense directly from wholesale medication bottles. They're going to modify the onboard software to enable integration with the pharmacy management software that already exists. And then they're going to do a beta test in up to two central fill pharmacies. So uh, I really think that this group addressed the reviewer concerns. I reviewed it previously, and I think they really did address those concerns. And that includes the modification, that second aim, adding that second aim in about modification of the software for better integration with the um, pharmacy uh, management software. That was a concern that we had. So I, I really like that. Um, I think they met the milestones. They, they well met the milestones and exceeded them from the phase one. And they really have a solid approach and kind of clear success criteria and clear rigor. I, I, I really think it's a solid, you know, a solid proposal now. I still wish that they did more than two um, pharmacies in their beta test, but I recognize that that's, you know, within the boundaries of this phase two and within what they're going to do that I think it's reasonable. Um, you know, I can want more, but I understand that this is what they're able to do. And they, they kind of explained that really well, I thought, in their response. They gave a, a really solid uh, response to review. And so that's why I have it as a two. Dr. Stark, okay. can I jump in here for just a minute to Surely. point out sure. that um, 
it really is a breach of your own confidentiality to say that you reviewed the previous application. So try, you know, going forward, let's not get into that. So these are new dogs, they came in new, and we're all fresh. Good point, Dr. Marshall, good point. Okay, um, why don't we go on to our second reviewer who is uh, Dr. San Diego. Where are you, Dr. San Diego? Oh, I'm in Monument Valley now, so ah, okay. um, yeah. Um, well, I have looked at the uh, application, reviewed it carefully, and I, I guess my, my score is based on a couple of, of, you know, important things that I noted in the application. One was that the commercial development plan to me was overly optimistic. The market size um, and some of the other data that they included, you know, just showed some um, overwhelming optimism on the, on the part of the uh, applicant. Um, I'm going to also, uh, I was a bit concerned about a national caregivers meeting that was, um, that happened about uh, five months ago where they failed to um, note in their application some other technologies that actually may, may impact what they are doing in the application. So that was a national meeting that was open to all um, and uh, papers and abstracts that were you know, uh, available to the public to view uh, prior to the meeting, that seemed to have missed, they've missed that very important uh, data that could have, I believe, impacted uh, some of the uh, information that they included in the application. And I'll add that my very dear professor, uh, friend, Professor Malstrom, has working on something that's really similar Wait, to this. Hang on a well, second, Dr. Oh, San Diego. Is, is this public information or private information? No, I, it's, public information. I, I, the, I agree. The, the national meeting public, but the conversation with my friend, Professor okay. Malstrom is not public. So why don't we um, set that aside? For okay. Now. All right. Sorry about that. Right. No problem. So the, those are the reasons why I have given this application the score that I did. Okay. Um, then we have, uh, last but not least, Dr. Ogden. Well, I'm going to have to disagree with the negative critiques. I was very excited about this application. I think they more than adequately address the concerns in the resubmission. Um, I think that they, the way their approach was, was scientifically rigorous. And I think that this should be funded. Oh, well, we don't make funding decisions. We can recommend it based on the science, but funding decisions are the purview of program. Oh, okay. Okay. Anything else, Dr. Ogden? Um, that's it. I was very excited about this application. Okay. Um, and I do believe there could be a clinical trial in this, a small one, a beta trial. Is that correct? There or? is, there is, yep. And did they uh, articulate their study timelines adequately? The yeah, I, I, again, I thought the approach was, was really well done. I think they really addressed all of the, you know, clinical trials issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then human subjects protections and in also inclusion, women, minorities. Yep. And yep. Really solid. Span, well, all of that solid. Okay. And well described. They okay. followed the instructions. Good for them. Glad to hear that. Um, okay. Well, then before we um, conclude the discussion, why don't we open the discussion to the floor. Would any of the other reviewers like to contribute at this point? I just want to, you know, comment on 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 Carmen's, uh, Dr. San Diego's um, comments about, you know, I agree about the public meeting um, and that maybe is something to consider, although obviously that happened after this application, but I think even with that, that um, information and I, I also happen to, to look at that, that information since it is public information. Um, I felt that this is still um, extremely relevant and I, I, you know, I just beg to disagree there. I, I really do think this is still a solid proposal and, and really, you know, has good significance and is, is, a, is a positive one. I, I factored that in, you know, and that's why it's a two and not, you know, an outstanding one. Um, but I still think there's, you know, it's a solid, a solid effort here. Okay. Any other comments before I try to summarize the discussion? Okay. Is so, that, wait, 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 just a minute. Yes. 
is salad good enough for a score of a two? I mean, isn't isn't a two supposed to be much better than solid? Well, for me, I mean, that is as you know good as you're gonna get for me. Um, I tend to you know two is you can use the whole range, Doctor Stark. You know, from one uh, yeah, but you know, I hate to do that, and I'm generally very negative about everything. So you know, the fact that I've gotten to the point where you know I think it's 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 a two. I mean, that's for those who know, who have, you know, reviewed with me before, this is pretty much as good as it gets. Okay. <clears throat> Any other discussion? H Equity here. Yes, Mr. Equity. I what like would this you like application. To... Okay, excellent. Uh, and the strength of its phase one prototype. I thought they did a really good job. Mm -hmm. My only concern is that the beta test is limited to two central fill pharmacies. I think Dr. Stark mentioned this. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that they will not be able to test the robustness of their software regarding its integration with pharmacy management software. Did they discuss whether the two beta testers um, would utilize the same software systems or compatible software systems? They did actually, and that was one of the, so, so that is, I completely agree with, with your thoughts there. They did address that. Um, they are using a different software system. So they're, they're really trying to test it out in as, you know, kind of these different environments, um, recognizing again, there's only two of them. So I think they, they picked the best two I thought they could, given the limitations in, again, you know, you can only do so much in this phase two. And, and the point of this is really to get to some kind of inflection point, either a partner or an investor or something. I mean, it's not supposed to take it all the way. I, I will okay. say that one positive I found here is that in their commercialization plan, they talk about that even though they may have limited experience bringing, bringing products to market, they talk about their board of advisors, the scientific mm -hmm. advisory board, you know, and, and these consultants and CEOs that they're bringing, CMOs, you know, they really do have a lot of expertise in bringing products to market. So, you know, even though maybe these two have not done it over and over again, they, they are bringing in people that can do that for them. Who knows? Maybe they'll even bring in Mr. Equity. Maybe he could do something here. I, I'm sorry, but I wasn't even finished with my comments. Oh. So oh, if Equity, you will please. allow me to kind of get back to where I was. Um, so I was raising, I was asking some questions about their software systems. Now I want to just pivot a little bit. Uh, did they discuss the range of accuracy that they were expecting between these two central fill pharmacies? I mean, in terms of 0.00x percent? Yes, did they, they did. That at all? Yes, they did. They did it. They're looking for 99.99 percent. .99%. But how about the range? I mean, do they expect both of them just to hit it at 99.99? They don't. I mean, they're, so they are being reasonable and they did discuss, I'm kind of scrolling through the application here, but I, I remember that they did kind of talk about the, there was a range within several, you know, within several fractions of a percentage point that they ex anticipated. And again, I do think it's reasonable. I mean, and they did talk about a through point, uh, a throughput that was about, a hundred blisters per minute, you know, I mean, I think again, all the, what they kind of provided as their goals seemed reasonable to me, given the situation at hand. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'll now turn the floor back over to our esteemed uh, professor. Okay. Um, any other comments or shall I try to summarize this discussion? Okay. I'll give it a shot. Um, it looks like the phase one was very successful. Um, they met their milestones. They have a logical plan for next step in this phase two. Uh, it is a resubmission. They did a good job of addressing the concerns of the previous reviewers and even exceeding expectations. Um, generally, it looks like this is a, a really great idea with a, with. Um, with market potential. There was some concern that the commercialization plan was overly optimistic about this. However, it looks like they have a very solid group of advisors with mark, uh, commercialization expertise in place to guide them through this process. Um, 
it looks like the uh, human subjects in clinical trials are adequately taken care of. No problem there. Um, did I miss anything? Okie dokie. Well, then why don't we go back to our assigned reviewers and see what you recommend as a final score. So, Dr. Stark, what are you thinking now? I'm, I'm staying at a two. Okay. That's a tough love two from you then, I guess, huh? Um, okay. Uh, Dr. San Diego, what is your thought now for a final score? Well, after listening to my colleagues and taking into consideration that even though the uh, commercial development plan, in my opinion, was not stellar in terms of how they had worked out their market size and everything. They do have a good uh, board of scientific directors involved, and I do feel like they that's going to help the company. And also understanding that I cannot include a, uh, you know, knowing information that is not mm -hmm. public, mm -hmm. I'm going to, um, I am, in, my score will go from a six to a four. To a four. Okay. And then finally, um, Dr. Ogden, where, where do you land on a suggested I, final score? I am sticking to an enthusiastic one. Okie doke. So that makes us have a rel relatively robust range um, of scores from one to four. Does anyone plan to vote outside that range? Yeah, I'm thinking about voting a five. Really? Well, um, re refresh my memory. What, why, why is that? What is your five for? Well, do, you know, I'm a little concerned about them only using these two pharmacies. Ah, the two pharmacies. And uh -huh. that's a concern for me. Okay. Now, do I have to explain why I'm going outside the range? Well, you do, and it, frankly, you did mention it during the discussion, and if I had recalled that, I would not have made you explain again, but I did it, so thank you very much for explaining. Okie doke. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so everyone, um, mark your score sheet, and then we'll talk about non-scorable issues, such as the budget. Would somebody like to tell me what you think of the budget? I thought the budget was, was reasonable. Yeah, yeah I agree. Me I too. agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. So any problems with things like resource sharing or authentication? That all came No. Out? Okay. Okay. Well, then that concludes the discussion of the second application. So uh, since we only have two applications in this meeting, I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Marshall. All right. Thank you very much. Um, great job, everyone. I think you've hit all of the topics. And I noticed that a couple of people had COIs that were taken care of. So if you have any issues with the discussions that we've had, please note them on your post meeting forms, e-sign that. You have three days to update any of the critiques that you have made changes to. So please, please, if you've changed your score, the critiques should reflect your new score, not what was there now. Please update those. Um, it's, it gets to be problematic when trying to explain scores that are way out of line with the comments that are made. So please take care of those. And with that, we will close the meeting. Okay, great. So we're done. Thank you very much. Application resources, embedded links to small business resources, database of NIH-supported research, and NIA-supported animal model resources. On to the Q&A. Thank you, everyone, for all of your comments and feedback. Uh, we did uh, have some questions about whether this is a real session. Um, this is a mock review based on some realistic scenarios. Uh, however, this is mock, so we hope that you've enjoyed the opportunity to see what a review process is like. We have received uh, many questions, um, so we will just quickly touch on a few application resources. I'm going to um, ask Dr. Todheim if you want to add anything here, and then we'll move over to the Q&A. No, yeah, all of these are linkable, and you'll get this, you know, as was said by Thursday, um, and there are several other resources um, available and, and coming, so, um, you know, a lot more to come. And also, if I could say, I mean, you know, the um, this was a little different if you've attended any of our webinars before and that we had this mock session, not just presentations. Um, these webinars are really obviously designed for your benefit as 
past and potential applicants to the programs at NIH. Connect with NIA, nia.nih.gov slash SBIR. On Twitter, at NIA underscore SBIR. On LinkedIn, NIA Office for Small Business Research. Email, NIA Small Business at mail.nih.gov. Links to upcoming events, funding opportunities, and mailing list sign up. Um, so those feedback forms that, you know, are being linked here and being sent out in the chat, those are absolutely critical for us to know that if we're actually serving you and if we should keep doing these webinars and how we should be doing these webinars. So please just take a couple of minutes uh, today while it's fresh, you know, join the, the Q&A to fill those out. And I, I think, I know we have a lot of questions, so we will be able to go until 2.30 uh, if there are, you know, a, a lot of questions. So we will be able to go a little longer to address uh, some of the questions that were sent. Contact us. National Center for Advancing Transactional Sciences, NCATS-SBIRSTTR at mail.nih.gov, National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, NIMHD info at nimhd.nih.gov, Center for Scientific Review, Kramer KM at mail.nih.gov, National Institutes of Health, online inquiry link or email sbir at od.nih.gov. Thank you, Todd. And on your screen, you will see uh, some contact information if you have any specific questions you'd like to follow up with folks on. Um, we have received well over 50 questions, uh, so please be patient. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, and we may have to uh, condense light questions. Again, as Todd mentioned, please do um, fill out the feedback form as you are listening to these Q&As. So I'm going to start off with um, a couple of questions that relate to conflict of interest. Uh, what if a reviewer is chosen from academia and is connected with a company developing a similar technology to the one he's reviewing? Do you ensure that they would rest, uh, recuse themselves? That question, I'm going to kick that to you, Dr. Rashan. <laughs> um, in general, we will, the SRO is familiar with the area, so they may flag that on their own. The other possibility is that the applicant can identify <clears throat> the people that might be in direct conflict. And then finally, the, the reviewer themselves. By and large, the folks that we get from academia are very concerned about confidentiality and conflict of interest, and they will flag things that are even not conflicts to us, according to policy. So they're very conservative about flagging things. Thank you. And if there's a conflict of interest comes up during the review panel, are applicants notified? Um, <clears throat> no, because that would, that would compromise confidentiality of the review process. So what we do is the app, the reviewer who or the panel member who would be in conflict notifies us, they are removed from the room, they don't score the application and they don't participate in the discussion. Thank you. I'm gonna ask a couple of questions about perceived bias. So during the mock panel, uh, Dr. Stark stated that she will never give a rating of one and that two is the best any application can get from her. How does the committee deal with that kind of personal bias? <laughs> Everyone is in stunned silence, I think. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll Maybe you to you, explain herself. <laughs> yeah, I guess I have to explain myself, huh? Um, but I do think, you know, I, I think I, I pointed that out because people do have, you know, there is the um, there is the the score range, and and as was pointed out, hey, you can use the score range, and and I know that the scientific review off officers and the chairs do try to encourage the reviewers to use the range, much like they encourage the reviewers to update their, to their critiques after the review is done. And, and, and really, they, they do work hard to help the reviewers, um, one, you know, understand what that score range is, as well as understand, you know, follow those kind of best practices. But at the end of the day, it is up to an individual reviewer, right? I mean, and I think some things, and this is, I'm sure, um, Alan could talk a little bit about this, and, and Kathy, because you all have seen a number of these reviews, but reviewers will have their own way of scoring. And while 
other reviewers may bring up, hey, or, or even the chair may say, hey, look, you're, you're saying a lot of negative comments for a very positive score or vice versa. Um, sometimes talking through that will help uh, an, a, an individual kind of rethink their score and recalibrate. And I've, I've certainly seen that as well. The other thing that we do, uh, and you're right, you're right about the recommend, you know, when you're listening to a conversation, you're going, I don't hear any positives here, or I don't hear any negatives here. And the panel will start taking that up as well and try and do peer pressure. But one of the things that SROs do is to maintain a list after the meeting to look at how the scores behave. And we'll flag people and say, this person is a really tough scorer or this person is a really um, lenient scorer compared to the rest of the panel and even internally, you know, internally consistent. And if we find people that consistently do that, we will not invite them back. So if, if they can't do work within an acceptable range of how they score applications and how they discuss things and points they bring up, um, or if they turn in critiques that are kind of shoddy, eventually, you know, after one or two meetings, additional meetings, we'll look at them and say, this is not helpful. And so they won't get invited back. So there's a whole range of ways that we try to keep a panel on task and fair. And um, so this is Derek. Go ahead. Go ahead, Derek. Uh, I just wanted to uh, add to what um, my colleague uh, Stephanie was saying with regard to um, sometimes being uh, questioned about the, um, the connection between your score and the weaknesses or the strengths. And I think that this is an important part of what happens at review, is that reviewers do say, or may be led to say, that they see some discrepancy between what's being said and the score. And sometimes that contributes to individual scoring outside of the range. And that's why I took the liberty to score outside of that range because I felt that um, they had a particular weakness um, that wasn't shared by the principal reviewers. Thank you. I'm gonna combine a few other questions on bias, but how does the review panel lead deal with uh, some personal bias that it seem, seems to be more subjective and opinion. And um, how can you deal with the fact that sometimes people may have proprietary information that they can't unsee, but still may have a biased influence on their assessment? I, I was gonna turn that over to uh, Dr. Cooper because I saw that you were, um, you know, confronting the panelists during some of those scenarios. So you want to add anything to that and respond to that question? In trouble with your sound. Looks like you're muted, Kathy. We can't hear you. Sorry, I was eating pistachio nuts is what I get. I muted myself. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> that's okay. Um, I would punt this to Dr. Rashawn first. <laughs> um, I mean, basically, the question is, can we remind? And no, we can't. If people come in with biases, those biases become evident during the discussion, then we have a chance to deal with them. If they keep them to themselves and you look at their scores and they're way out of range, that gives us an indication that maybe something's going on, but we really don't know what. So uh, we can't be thought police. Thank you. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll add. You know, some of the biases that people come up, come in with are well known and and out there, and it's really you know part of the job of the applicant to address those biases. Um, so you know, I'll, I'll give an example. You know, for Alzheimer's disease, there's a lot of concerns about the fact that you know that the known targets like amyloid hasn't worked. And okay, well, so if someone's coming in with an amyloid project you know, a reviewer could come in with a bias that that's just not going to be successful. Well, then it's really the job of the applicant to say, well, this amyloid project is different from other amyloid projects, and it's addressing amyloid in a different way than others have. And so, you know, it really, as, as you're an applicant and you're thinking about what are the biases that could come up in discussion, 
you know, think about that as you're writing that application so you can proactively address such biases. Well, and I would also add, if there is a um, matter of debate in the scientific community, so if, if the scientific community is in the middle of a debate about something, uh, chances are it will, and, and, and your product falls on one side or another of that debate, chances are the individuals on either side of that will be coming to that meeting, right? So you need to, I think, understanding that, that you know, sometimes things, and, and the amyloid hypothesis is a great example of that, you know, you know, sometimes these things do, you know, reviewers have differences of scientific opinion, and that is 100% allowed. I mean, there are differences in scientific opinion, and those are going to come out in the review. Which also goes to the idea that we don't try to encourage everyone to come to an agreement during the discussion. Um, we tell them that and give them the chance to vote outside the range so they can vote their conscience and their view of what the application has presented to them. And when the summary statements are put together, the SRO will explain that when this discussion started, there was a very diverse view of, of the application. And that view was somewhat mitigated during the discussion, and it was agreed that this, this, and this were strength, and this and this were weakness. But at the end of the discussion, there was still disagreement, and so you had a wide range of scores. And as a result, here's what the final impact was. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I'd like to add is if you know that you have a divided field or two camps in a field, you want to be sure when you're recruiting your reviewers that you have all viewpoints represented on your panel and not just one camp. Um, so that the actual um, discussion is more robust. Yep. Thank you. I want to acknowledge that we do have a fair number of folks who are potential new applicants and trying to understand more about the program. Um, so I'm going to just turn for the next few minutes uh, to a couple of application questions, and then we'll go back to the specific review questions. Um, so one, uh, one potential applicant wants to know whether there's a mechanism for that applicant organization to affect which institute an IH institute application will be assigned to for funding. And if you have received funding from one institute, the second part, can you switch to another? So yes to both. Uh, in the application, there is a PHS assignment request form where you can um, request a specific institute be assigned. Um, you can also request multiple institutes um, if you think multiple institutes are relevant. Um, in terms of, sorry, what was the second question now? Uh, if you get funding from one institute for phase one, for example, can you switch to another for phase two? So you can, you should talk to the phase one institute, but you know, if, if, if things, and I did see a question kind of about things shifting, you know, you get new information in the phase one that leads you to pivot the project. Um, you know, that's okay. You can, you know, some degree of pivot is allowed between the phase one and the phase two. So it doesn't need to be a direct, you know, carrying exactly what you were doing in the phase one. It still has to be, you know, follow up development, but it can include a pivot. Um, and, and that could result in, you know, an, another institute being a better home. So, you know, you can definitely discuss, I would discuss that first. If you're already awarded that phase one, discuss that with your program. Excuse me. This I'd is like to add, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I was going to add something about assignments. Why don't you talk about this first and then come back to assignments? Well, I was going to say something about the assignment, the okay. request. Um, okay. So let me, I'll, I'll go first. Thank okay, you. Sure. Um, I think that it is an underutilized strategy in terms of requesting a dual um, assignment or even um, two other institutes to which to send your application to. Uh, I think that Todd was right by encouraging you to speak with the program official uh, about, about that. And I would speak to the other pro um, program officials at the other institutes that you might be interested in sending or listing as a dual. Uh, this is something that um, I would encourage individuals to think about and to do. Thank okay. you. Right, and the point that I was going to make had to do with using that assignment request form to suggest potential institute assignments. Um, 
We're totally interested in um, what you would prefer, but in the end of the day, we're going to have to assign those applications to the institute that is uh, interested in your particular topic. Um, sometimes we make an assignment and the institute goes, oh, not us, and we have to change it. Um, but we do try to, to assign multiple institutes when possible, as Derek pointed out. Um, there's only primary and duals, but we can put on as many duals as we want. And so there's uh, many institutes have areas of science where they overlap in interest with other institutes. And so we can pile a few on there in dual so that other institutes, uh, institutes other than the primary, will see your science and see your application. And I just put the program contacts for the SBRS TTR programs um, in the chat so you can see a list of all of those. And if you're unsure um, which institute and center is the best, you know, after reading all the information and kind of reviewing it, you're still not sure, uh, you can always reach out to multiple program officers. You can always do that, but you can also email us at sbir at od.nih.gov. I'll put that email in the chat as well. And, and that's also good for any other questions, just general questions you may have about the SBR STTR program. And I'd like to point something else out is that it's not your responsibility to decide which institute you want. My group does make the assignments and we know what the institutes are interested in supporting. Um, but the point is, is that if you do have a preference, it, feel free to communicate that to us on the assignment request form. But otherwise, we can take care of it. We know what we're doing. Thank you. Um, there was a question that was prompted by uh, one of the review panels. And can you clarify whether preliminary data is expected on initial submission or after phase one? Preliminary data is not required for a phase one application. You have the option of of presenting it, but you don't have to. And you cannot be dinged if you don't present it. But it can help you if you do have it, because if exactly. you present it, it can be reviewed. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, your objective is to demonstrate rigor of prior research. Now, how you decide to do that is up to you. You can use preliminary data. You can use literature citations. You can use um, evidence of trials or whatever but you want to show a very rigorous foundation for what it is you're proposing to do and however you choose to do that. And I've seen, I mean, and again, think carefully what's really important here and I, and it kind of went by very quickly. So anything you put in the application can be reviewed. And that means if you put preliminary data, if you, if you rush to put preliminary data in and way overstate it or try, you know, they're going to review that and then, have, you know, the reviewers can go, hey, we have concerns that they're overstating this preliminary data. I mean, anything that you put in there is going to be reviewed. Now, there was a question about phase twos. Phase twos are expected to have preliminary data because you're supposed to, you're supposed to have the, the phase one data um, that you're going to then provide as, you know, the progress from the phase one and even a direct to phase two which is an option only in the SBIR program, should have phase one-like data. So you should have done all the work for a phase one, um, even if you didn't get the phase one. So even in those cases where we have that special direct to phase two option, you should have all that, that you should have a good solid amount of data that you're presenting. So phase two is different from phase one. Thank you. Can you all speak a bit about the how the primary, secondary, and tertiary reviewer is assigned, and are they assigned based on different aspects of the review? For example, primary for the scientific innovation, secondary for development pathway. Can you provide more insight on how those reviewers are selected? Okay. Um, Trying to balance the load is one aspect of it. So you're not going to give someone who's a commercialization expert all reviewer one assignments for nine assignments because that's just going to blow them out of the water in terms of the amount of time it would take to do that. So what we try and do is balance the need for particular expertise across the applications that we have in hand. 
And what that means is that, let's say we need a biostatistician to look at clinical trials. Um, that will be one of the people that will be on the application as a reviewer, and they may be, may be a reviewer one, reviewer two, or reviewer three. If it is a, an application that, for example, has a bit of commercialization, but not a lot, then we might have someone with expertise in commercialization as a reviewer three to add on their opinion to the science that's being done. So it, it, it all depends on what the application is trying to accomplish, how broad it is, what kind of expertise is needed, but the roles will really depend. Thank you. Can you talk a bit about study sections and how those are assigned? Kathy, you want to do that one? Well, sure. Um, so, you know, I've, you heard earlier on, um, Alan told you that the vast majority of small business applications are reviewed in uh, special emphasis panels at CSR. And so each of those special emphasis panels, just like our regular study sections, have a, a set of guidelines that are published on the CSR internet site that will tell you what kind of applications are reviewed in each of those. So what happens is when the applications come in the door, my team takes a look at them, uh, makes an assessment based on the science in your application and matching that to guidelines of a study section, one of those uh, special emphasis panels, and we assign it that way. Thank you. I'm going to do some quick fire questions because I'm watching. We do have um, just over 15 minutes. I want to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, can you speak to um, how much diversity is on panels uh, and if the reviewers are volunteers? And then also there were observers in some of these panels. What is their role and, and who's allowed to be an observer? Recruiting reviewer slides. Okay, reviewers are volunteers. Um, they are donating their time and energy <clears throat> and, and giving back to the biomedical research community. And we can't emphasize our thanks for that more than we do. I don't know how we would. I'd like to hold a party for all of them, but we're not allowed to do that. But yes, they're volunteers. Um, in terms of diversity, we go for as much diversity in every area that we can. And we try and represent the diversity in a particular discipline. So for example, in engineers, trying to find a, a hardcore woman engineer is a tough problem. And they're frequently overcommitted. So we can ask, but they may not have the time to do a particular panel or they may not be able to, to join us. So we go as much as we can in the SBIR world to find minorities, women, and so on. Um, but it's up up to the individual to volunteer to join us or not. And on that note of volunteering, um, can people and applicants suggest reviewers? And what is the process? You use the assignment request form and you can suggest expertise. Um, suggesting a specific reviewer would be problematic if you take that logically down the path and say, okay, I'm gonna suggest my friend Joe whatever to review my application. And if I see Joe whatever on the panel, then I have a connection into that panel and you get into a whole bunch of issues of confidentiality. So specific individuals, no. Expertise, absolutely. And you had asked about people who, you know, in our, in our mock study section, we had a program officer that was in, in attendance. And as you saw the program officer didn't, say anything. So I, as a, as a program officer, when I was a program officer, I attended a lot of study sections and I was there to listen and to kind of hear the conversation, you know, hear the conversations about the different applications um, that were within my portfolio. Um, as a program officer, the only time I spoke up is if there was a specific policy question, general policy question that the panel and the scientific review officer had either about the overall SBRS TTR program or uh, the specific program announcement or RFA. And it, it was very, very, and, and the scientific review officer was the one who said, I would like you to answer this specific question. So the, the program officer is only there um, really as an observer. Uh, in very rare occasions, they answer a very specific question, um, but it, it, they don't weigh in. They're, not allowed to give their two cents, uh, none of that. Right, and due to confidentiality, attendance at the meeting is really limited 
to people with a need to know. So that means basically the, the, the SRO, the reviewers, and relevant program officers, pretty much. So, so I would like to come in here too, because one reason why we do listening, it helps us when we have to discuss a summary statement with you after you get your summary statement. So while, after you get your summary statement, you can call the program officer that's listed on the summary statement and discuss this, you know, especially the weaknesses that were highlighted in the summary statement. And that helps the program officer. Um, we don't get to all the, 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 the study sections, but we try to get to as many study sections as we can. Mm -hmm. That's good intel. Uh, so the next question is based on a review feedback that a, an applicant has received. What are the publication expectations for the SBIR program? We have been criticized several times by reviewers for not publishing results. Small businesses need to maintain a competitive advantage and publishing results right away is not always in the best interest of the company. Yeah, that's, that's understandable. And, you know, same thing with data sharing. There's sometimes reasons that can be stated why, you know, data may not be shared immediately, um, you know, for proprietary reasons. So that, that all is, is understandable. And what if they get that feedback on the review uh, and they feel like it impacts their score, what should they do? So something like that should not be a score driving concern, um, you know, likely would be stated elsewhere in the uh, summary statement. Um, but, you know, they can contact our program officer and have that discussion. And, you know, as you heard with, you know, when we talked about kind of a budget, there are, there are things that get discussed in the uh, review that, do end up on the summary statement, but are not what affects the score. So, you know, that's, that's a discussion they can have with the program officer um, who can advise them on kind of how to address in the future, but often, you know, probably not the reason that they didn't get fun, that they didn't get selected for funding. Yeah, when you get the summary statement, it's got two pieces to it. One are the comments from reviewers and sometimes some bizarre comments can be made that the SRO doesn't catch. But what drives the final score is reflected in that summary statement, in the, the summary of discussion that's at the top. Yeah, and I mean, that's, that's an important point when it comes down to resubmissions, is that, you know, obviously the more, the more weaknesses in the summary statement that you can address in your resubmission, the better. But because that first paragraph called the resume and summary of discussion is has the major score driving concerns, that's where you want to focus your efforts in terms of addressing um, in your one page introduction to resubmission, the previous reviewer concerns. And, and I want to say, go ahead, Stephanie. I was just going to state, um, sometimes I used to get questions around the criteria scores. So you will get individual scores for the five criteria and um, People did try to add them up and average, and as you saw, that that's not quite how we score, right? So that that's not how your final overall score is calculated. And I used to have a love-hate relationship with those as a program officer. Um, they're very, very helpful. They kind of tell you, you know, looking across those five criteria. I used to tell people to use them to see where you're, you know, where do you seem to have the most weaknesses. So say if you keep getting uh, a worse score in approach, you might want to take a hard look at the, at the approach. If you, you know, if you're getting a really difficult score in, in, in significance, you might want to take a hard look at that and, and look at your, your section there. So they can point you to where your issues are and where your positives are. Um, but again, um, they're not going to average and add up to an overall score. That's not how those are supposed to be used. Um, reviewers can weigh any one of those um, more than the other, their other criteria scores. In addition, um, some reviewers, again, and, and you heard Alan there at the end, pleading, you know, with people, please update all of your, you know, your comments, please update your criteria scores. But sometimes, you know, people will update their comments, but will forget to update their criteria scores too. So just bear in mind that I think they're a guide, they're there to help you, but they're not the end all be all. They're not how we use, they're not used to calculate the overall score. Also, when people do resubmission, they will say, well, reviewer one said this about my blah, 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 and here's what we've done to address that. The problem is that reviewer one may not be in the meeting again. 
Um, and so trying to address specific things that specific people said isn't really going to get you anywhere. Look at, look at overall trends. What is the trend of what's being told to you in that summary statement? Thank you. And, and that relates to another question we got is, you know, addressing a situation where two reviewers will feel like everything is adequate in this, in this case on human subject protections and one does not, and they don't get detailed reasoning. Uh, would you recommend that they follow up any questions with their program officer? Yes. Um, yes. And, and yes. I mean, remember, I mean, disagreement will always be normal. You know, you talk to three people about anything, you know, one's likely not to agree with the other two. So, you know, that's part of, you know, human nature. Um, but, you know, the, the summary discussion will show kind of, you know, how they, where they came together and what were the concerns that multiple people had that, that really affected the final score. Thank you. And uh, we've gotten a couple more questions about just the protection of information that is shared through the application review process. Um, are there reviewers working under an honor system and do they have NDAs? And also, um, when you consider um, conflict of interest, do you also look at people who might be on the board of a company or an advisory instead of a direct competitor? Okay. There are several documents that are signed by the reviewers, and one of them is a confidentiality agreement, and they can't even see the applications or the list of applications until that is signed. So that is a legally binding document, and if NIH finds out that it's been violated, we will prosecute. Um, the next is the list. You take a look at list of applications and list of key personnel <clears throat> as a reviewer, and you identify the people that you feel you're in conflict with or the institutions that you're in conflict with. And that will get discussed with the SRO. The SRO is also going to look at your affiliation and if there is an indication in the application that the reviewer would be in conflict with that application, then the SRO will place them into conflict. So there are multiple levels and yes, it is an honor system, um, but there are consequences for violating it. Yeah, and you know, I mean, something that comes up all the time is applicants don't put enough in their application to, you know, get a strong review and for the reviewers to identify the merits of that application. So, you know, there are protections in place. I mean, of course, you know, the applicant, you know, has to worry about their own, you know, proprietary things and protections, but important for the applicant to also remember that, you know, they need to put key things in there to demonstrate to the viewers why this is different and better than the alternatives out there. And if they don't, then they're not going to get reviewed as such. The other piece is that once the review is finished, the app, the reviewers have the obligation to destroy securely all of the information that they have been provided during the review period. So any documents, any score sheets, anything related to the review must be destroyed securely. Thank you. Uh, do you publish the cutoff scores for proposals that made it to discussions? No. Thank you. Um, if a reviewer got corrected in his assessment during the discussion, say scored application lower because of absence of preliminary data, or for some other reason, would that score get revised? Yeah, so that would be taken into account into the final score that they give, which is, as you remember, we went around and we all gave our final scores at the end, at least the preliminary reviewers, uh, but then everyone else on the panel will submit the final score. And that would be average to, to come up with actual score. Um, so, you know, if they were corrected, they likely would take that into question into the final score. As Stephanie said a few moments ago, they are instructed to actually then go and potentially change their comments and the criterion scores, but they don't always do that. So, you know, that's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, it's something I don't think that we've made specifically clear is that let's say you have a panel of 30 people all of the people who are not in conflict are going to be listening to that discussion and every one of them is required to supply a final overall impact score based on the discussion. 
Exactly. Exactly. So when you go, I mean, there's two reasons why you can't just average the scores and come up with a final score. Um, one is, as Stephanie said, the criteria. You, when reviewers give the final score, they're not giving each criterion score. So, you know, it's, it's not a, a straight average there. But two, you're only seeing three people's scores. There are 20, 30 scores that are used in making that average. So, you know, that's why you, um, it's not a straight average of, of the criterion scores that you see. And generally people score based on which reviewer's opinion swayed them more. And so it might not be, you know, a perfect average of the scores because reviewer two was particularly persuasive to a larger numbers of the members on the panel. And so they tended to score more like reviewer two than one or three. And how do you take the scores? Are you averaging them out? Do you ever identify outliers? Well, it, the preliminary overall impact scores are averaged to set the order of review. And then the final score is the average of all scores times 10. And, and as you saw in the review, if somebody wanted to score outside the range, they had to give a justification. So in terms of the question about outliers, that yeah. happens in real time. Right. And, and SROs piece, look for that too. When you're looking at the final score matrix that you get and you see a real outlier score, you go back to your notes and make sure that that person spoke up and had their opinion counted into the discussion. Yeah, one of the things we say for people that are scoring outside the range is, as Kathy pointed out during the mock study section, the reason that you're scoring outside the range has to have been brought up during the discussion. It can't be something that you know about and the panel doesn't know about. Right. Question about intellectual property. Is it advisable for the applicant to get a patent filed before submission of the grant application? Um, and is a one company saying they filed a provisional patent, but it has yet to file the patent at the end of the year? And um, is it a must that they disclose proprietary information in the application? Unfortunately, Lily had to drop off. She would have been perfect to answer this. Uh, so um, it, it really depends. I mean, I want to give a straight, you know, it really depends on a case-by-case -case basis here. Um, you know, th there is no straight rule that patents have to be approved or filed at, at certain points. Um, so, you know, that's something you could discuss with the program officer before you apply. I don't know if someone else wants to add to that. Well, if you're bringing a phase one in and you're doing exploratory work, the idea that you're going to have a patent is probably far-fetched. Um, one, it's going to be too expensive to do that, to try and do a phase one application. So, you know, Todd's right. It's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, what you're doing with patents is showing that you're protecting your intellectual property, and that's probably going to be more germane in a phase two or, or a fast track. Right. And I wanted to add something about the intellectual property in the sense that you have to put, and I think Todd mentioned this before, you have to put enough information in the application that people can assess it. I remember one time squabbling with an applicant who was making a really fantastic cancer vaccine, but that's all he would tell us. He was making this fantastic cancer vaccine, but he didn't want to say anything about what, it, what cancer it was for or how the vaccine worked or anything because it was his intellectual property. Yep. And, you know, we kind of went round and round and said, you know, people can't tell whether it's a great idea or whether it's going to work unless you tell us what the vaccine is. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for all the questions they've given. Um, there are some questions that are specific to understanding the programs. And we want to show you um, the contact us for all of the institutes who are here and represented, um, as well as we have chatted out all of the NIHSBR contacts. So feel free to reach out to us directly if you have any additional questions. Contact us slide. We also wanted to um, remind you to- and Monique, I think, platform. Monique, NIA is on another slide, right? Because I don't see us on here. There we go. Connect with NIA slide. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yep. Application assistance program, embedded registration link. And also, I wanted to note a, a couple of sessions. There is an application assistance program coming up if you're new and interested in really getting help on 
um, how to apply. We will chat out the link to register for that, but that is November 3rd at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, there November is also 12th. SBIR and STTR funding webinar with Delaware Bio and BioNJ, embedded registration link. Um, a meeting coming up that will provide more um, basic information on the programs themselves, um, and that will be Wednesday, December 17th, and we will chat out the registration for that. With that, I want to thank you all for your time, especially our panelists and our participants. We appreciate the thoroughness of both your comments and all of the questions that we've received. And please, again, fill out that feedback form. We'd love to hear from you as we design more of these workshops. Feedback link. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all.